October 31st, 2008, following a 40% drop in the S&P 500, the financial world was in shambles. Bank failures, unemployment, and rapidly deteriorating conditions in the housing market gave way to the worst recession in America since 1929. In the middle of all of this panic, in an unknown corner of the internet, a paper is published by an unidentified author called Satoshi Nakamoto. The publication is an academic masterpiece, a revolutionary text that combines cryptography, economics, and computer science science outlining a brand new concept. A decentralized digital currency that can be transferred on the peer-to-peer -peer Bitcoin network. Unknown to the world, this was the start of a revolution. Initially, it was a worthless coin meant as a proof of concept, but it developed a real use case following the rise of black market sites like Silk Road. During the website's 30 months of existence, Bitcoin's value exploded. As the black market site exclusively accepted Bitcoins as payment, it ended up transacting 9.9 .9 million Bitcoins. The price rose from 30 cents in 2011 to 16 dollars in 2012 an epic 4,000 percent run that attracted the attention of speculators and enthusiasts bitcoin would spend the next 10 years developing into one of the most amazing stories in the history of capitalism reaching a peak of $68,000. But most of us know this story. The point of this video isn't to retell it, but rather to show the other side of the coin, a shocking tale of fraud, lies, and greed. What would you do if someone handed you $100,000 right now? I'd dump it all into Bitcoin. Or maybe Luna, I heard that's the future. You know what they say, buy the dip, except no one mentions what to do when the dip keeps dipping. Honestly, I don't think anyone knows what to do with 100000 right now. That's why people are sitting on more cash now than in the past 20 years, according to clients surveyed by Bank of America. And with every major index headed to bear territory and the crypto market losing $1 trillion, the Wall Street Journal says the options are shrinking. But I know what you could potentially do with it, for real this time, because get this, Bloomberg recently asked some financial experts this same question, and the result, they overwhelmingly recommended investing in alternative assets. Like this one you probably aren't thinking about. I'm talking about the white hot art market. When I say hot, I mean it. In fact, the Wall Street Journal calls it among the hottest markets on earth. Don't believe me? This Andy Warhol painting was purchased for just $5,000 in 1967. And just last week, it was resold for an insane $195 million. For perspective, if you average that price appreciation over those 55 years, that's $10,000 a day, every day. And it's not just the Warhol. Contemporary art pieces have outpaced the S&P by 164% for the last 25 years, all while sharing a very low correlation to the equities market. This got me so interested that I reached out to the only platform I trust for investing in art, Masterworks. And they were super pumped to partner with my viewers. What makes Masterworks so compelling? Since launching, the three paintings they've sold so far have returned a net annualized gain of 30% to investors. And even though I have to add that past performance is no guarantee of future results, those numbers blow my mind. No wonder they have already been valued at over $1 billion. Demand is high, so there is a wait list, but my partnership with Masterworks means my viewers have priority access to skip their wait list. Just click the link in the description. Now, away from the art world, like I mentioned earlier, the crypto world has once again risen to the top of the headlines, and it started decades ago. Turns out that one paper written by an anonymous author that I mentioned earlier ends up creating an entire trillion dollar industry with layer upon layer added to a base held up by a piece of code that was supposed to revolutionize finance. But to many people, this coin is nothing more than a tulip, another bizarre showcase of human greed and stupidity, a tragedy that at its base is nothing more than a sophisticated Ponzi scheme peddled by celebrities, influencers, and even governments. In today's video, we look at the bizarre world of crypto, examining the potential that this may just be the largest fraud in financial history. Now, creating such a video would not only take months of research, but cramming it into a 10-minute showcase would be near impossible. So I'm going to focus this video on something very specific that will play out in the next couple of months. You see, what started off as a great technology used mostly by drug dealers, money launderers, and criminals turned into a speculative financial instrument. Don't be surprised at this. If there's one thing people are good at, it's leveraging money. In the same way banks saw houses and created securitized mortgages introducing an era of CDOs and other so-called derivatives, fintech startups saw Bitcoin and created a form of securitized stablecoin earning accounts. Now, I know technically this is incorrect, but for the sake of simplicity, bear with me as I lay out this wild but true story that is taking the crypto world to the brink of collapse. 
You see, when Bitcoin's popularity took off and people outside of the Silk Road saw its potential, some were genuine believers that this technology could free us from the shackles of traditional banking, while others at the very top of finance used this disguise to take their golden opportunity under a perception of revolutionary finance. There were billions of dollars at play here. In the latter part of the decade, the crypto world took off, and at the center of it all were the exchanges. These were places where you could sign up, buy, and sell Bitcoin and various other cryptocurrencies. Places like Coinbase, Crypto.com, BlockFi, and Binance. Now, without boring you to death with the details, the exchanges made money not on the price of Bitcoin, but rather on transactions. This just means every time you bought or sold Bitcoin, they took out a fee. A great business model, but like everything else in banking, greed took over, especially in this new, largely unregulated space. Turns out when Bitcoin's price is rapidly rising, the volume on their site explodes and new users come rushing in. Coinbase, for example, went from 23 million users in 2018 to 89 million in their last reported quarter. That kind of growth and new revenue isn't achievable just through marketing dollars. The exchanges needed something more, and a wild new concept allowed them to do so. It was called staking, but it also went by a number of different names intended to create an illusion of safety. Now this is when the story turns a bit sideways. While marketing and hype can take you far, it's not enough to push prices to trillion dollar evaluations. What you need are leverage and wild speculation. The exchanges helped create something called stable coins. These were cryptocurrencies that tracked the price of a dollar, meaning they would never fluctuate in price, always maintaining their value, thus remaining stable, thus their name stable coins. So why would anyone buy these if they had no chance of making money on them? Well, the exchanges developed an incentive. Let's say you deposited $100,000 on Gemini. Gemini would come to you and say, hey, you can sign up for one of our staking programs and make some great yield. What this means is essentially you give them $100,000 in cash and they give you $100,000 in stable coins, something like USDC. A lot of people look at that and go, great, so I'm getting 100 k USDC, which is backed by cash that is insured in their FDIC bank account, so this is really like 100 k cash, and if I just agree to stake it, they'll give me a yield sometimes as high as 8%. For many people, this is great. 8% a year on 100K is $8,000. Not a bad return for doing nothing with supposedly very low risk, especially when you compare it to traditional banks, which are giving less than 0.5% on savings accounts. But here's the problem. When they say stake, what they really mean is that you're essentially lending them your money. Now, if you really want to get into the weeds of how all of this works, you can watch this video by Meet Crypto. It explains the functionality in detail, but for the sake of simplicity, just understand that if you are participating in these earnings programs using stablecoins, your account balance on the screen isn't really your account balance. Using various loopholes and sophisticated wording, exchanges like Coinbase can get away with a lot. They lend your money over and over again, creating substantial risk if there for any reason was a significant downturn and a bank run. On top of this, it's very unclear if these stablecoins are really backed up by an equivalent amount of dollars. For example, USDC, which is a popular stablecoin available on Coinbase, is supposedly backed up one to one. This means for every USDC you have, there should be one dollar in a bank account somewhere. But the reality is, we don't really know. Finding specific information is very hard. We do know that USDC is attested monthly by the top five accounting firm, Grant Thornton. However, it's not audited. An attestation is an assurance that published valuations add up correctly. It provides no verification of the integrity of those valuations as attestations are intended to be used as follow-ups to an actual audit, not as a replacement for one. And this is no accident. The fact that USDC and others like Tether forgo audits and jump straight to attestations is not helping their cause for transparency, especially in the face of recent meltdowns like Luna, which lost 99.99% of its value after it lost its peg to the dollar. And if you think top five accounting firms are immune from fraud, look no further than Arthur Anderson, the people who helped hide Enron for years. Now, I know I'm going to get plenty of comments below from crypto people calling me all kinds of things. Take a look at any post from Reddit questioning the safety of stablecoins and you'll find the responses appalling. Very few contain actual evidence or arguments. Instead, most of the comments are fueled by angry, delusional crypto peddlers who likely have massive sums of money tied up in these questionable accounts. Grant Thornton's March report that verifies the USDC reserves is a total of three pages. A joke. Now, can I prove that USDC and Tether and others like them are frauds? 
No, I cannot. But given the lack of transparency, they are a ticking time bomb. It's very possible that stablecoins and their respective lending programs, derivative instruments, and hidden layers of leverage could serve to bring down the entire crypto market if they were to implode. What's to say that these things aren't the synthetic CDOs of the crypto world? If for any reason USDC or Tether lost its peg, the contagination would spread throughout the crypto markets and significantly bring down the price of Bitcoin. For anyone investing in these earn programs, I would love to hear from you in the comments thank you guys for watching as always please make sure you hit that like and subscribe button if you enjoyed it